Hey there. Uh, well, I thought I would um, continue with John this morning. Let's see how we go. John 10 is one of the best chapters probably in the Bible, and I'll probably uh, not do it justice. <laughs> but I'm going to just say whatever I see, you know. Um, so he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs in some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To the, him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And the stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. <clears throat> Uh, so that's the first section in red. Uh, you know, here's where I get the whole thief and robbers. You know, when Jesus says in the church, letter to the church of Philadelphia, he says, take heed to let what you have, let no one steal your crown. It flipped my understanding of what it means to watch. Because we know the day of the Lord comes like a thief, right? And it shouldn't come upon us unaware. And so we think, well, that means watch the news. Because when you see Russia do this, when you see Turkey do this, when you see... And that stuff is true. It's important. I don't want to belittle Bible prophecy. Sometimes you got to present both sides of the thing. Uh, but I've said many times, you can be fully aware of Bible prophecy and not even be saved. <laughs> And cut, be an enemy of the gospel. And definitely you can be fully aware of Bible prophecy and not be watchful. It is not a matter of watching those things. It is a matter of watching and guarding your crown against thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers want to come and spoil you and take you captive and bring you into bondage. And take away your assurance. And take away your garment. And take away your food. Take away everything that you need to stand confidently before the Lord. And so you can be saved, but then you're not abiding in Him. You've been captured. You have been carried off as spoil. You've been defrauded. And that is tragedy. Um, because... Like First John says, now abide in him so that when he appears, you may also have confidence at his coming and not shrink back in fear or shame. And I used to think that that meant, oh, I haven't done enough in my life and I didn't, I wasn't spiritual enough. And so now when he comes, I'm just ashamed because it turned out that I wasn't very good after all, you know. Well, that's when I had a mammon concept of rewards and a lot of works concepts in my understanding. Now I understand that to be, I let someone defraud me. I let the thieves and robbers sit upon me, and I, I didn't recover my crown. They took it, you know. Now that's not, see, the crowns, w there are people who have a very literal view of the crowns. You know, there's five of them, and you can earn it this way, and, and they think, well, I'm going to go out and earn this crown today, and I'm going to earn that crown, and it's very much a matter of putting God in your debt by works, which according to Romans 4, uh, it's either all of grace or all of works. There's no in between. If it's of works, it's no more of grace. If it's grace, it's no more works. And not only that, that has to do with not just your salvation, but also the reward. If you read Romans 4 carefully, you see that even the reward is reckoned of grace. So it's not a matter of putting God in your debt where he owes you something. It is entirely a matter of God's grace. The rewards have to be by grace. Now, I do believe in reward, but as I've studied it, the more I think about it and, and look at it, I believe that the different uh, apostles have different language to describe the same thing. And Peter calls it an abundant entrance into the kingdom furnished to you. Um, and John calls it having confidence that is coming. And Paul calls it rejoicing with joy, un, 
exceedingly at his coming and or being sincere and without offense and having the full assurance of faith in the day of Christ. It is a matter of when I come, will I find faith on the earth? That watchfulness has to do with holding fast to what you have and letting no one defraud you and steal your confidence and your rejoicing. It, trust me, if you have a thankful heart, you know, look at the time we're living in. Uh, the offenses abound. The person who is able to hold fast to his crown and not, and which means really clinging to the gospel and not letting it be compromised, uh, to have a rejoicing heart right now, a thankful heart, a heart full of appreciation of the Lord and fervor for the gospel uh, that saves you. Doesn't mean you're an evangelist. It means that you appreciate the gospel and you are staying on it. You're not letting anyone compromise it and you're turning away from anyone that would. You're holding fast to your crown and it's producing. It's going to produce a refreshing and a rejoicing. I believe there's a season of refreshing before we go home uh, for people who hold fast to their crown. It's going to turn into wine and we're going to drink of it and we're, it's, it's going to transfigure us. <laughs> But uh, that's just my view of watchfulness. And I said all that because uh, he says he enters into the door into the sheepfold but climbs another way, the same as a thief and a robber. What does a thief do? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we say, well, that's the devil. That is true. But Jesus identifies it as people who are in the sheepfold but entered in another way. What's the, what, what's the way you have to enter in? The door. And who's the door? Christ himself, the shepherd of the sheep. These have entered another way, yet they're in the sheepfold, right? He that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. That's Christ. And also anyone who enters in by Christ is a mini shepherd. You automatically shepherd people. If you come in by Christ, and then as people ask you, well, what are you doing? You say, oh, I'm, I'm believing in Jesus and he's, he's my sufficiency and he's my everything and he's my shepherd. You know what that's doing? That's shepherding them. They're going, oh, I want that too. And they hear his voice in your voice. Uh, to him, the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts his own sheep forth, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. So the thieves and the robbers are strangers. They don't know the shepherd or the shepherd doesn't know them. I believe these are the same ones that he says, you know, uh, they said, haven't we done all these works in your name, you know? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You're a stranger. What, what is the deal, you know? And it says the sheep hear his voice, Christ's voice, the shepherd's voice, but they don't hear the voice of the strangers. So not only are these thieves and robbers and strangers in the sheepfold, but they've occupied speaking positions, <laughs> They're stealing and robbing with their speaking. And in contrast, there's the shepherd's voice. And he calls you by name. So it is a personal, compelling call. You know, just like Jesus called the disciples by name and they followed him. We've done the same. He has called us. You want to know if you've, you say, I have never heard from God. I never heard a voice or anything. Well, 1 John 5 tells us that uh, it is the spirit that bears witness and if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. And this is the record which he has testified concerning his son. He who believes this testimony has the record in himself. So it is actually the spirit. You have heard the speaking of the spirit if you've come to believe in Jesus Christ at, and, and you recognize him as your shepherd. You've been called by name. You did hear his voice and you won't hear the voice of a stranger. So that means we recognize his voice. And as I've said many times, I'm not here to teach something new. I should be registering something that you already know within you. You have the witness of the spirit in you. And if you've been listening to the shepherd and reading your Bible and growing in the knowledge of Christ and growing in grace, then what I say should register with you. It shouldn't be out of left field and be like, I can't see that in the Bible. Where did he get that? 
No, you should go, oh, yeah, that's, that's right. All I'm doing is providing more words and utterance to the sense you have inside. And that sense is the inward witness. That sense is the speaking of the shepherd. Don't get mystically confused about the voice of the shepherd. There's so many people who make a big deal about how the Lord spoke to me this and the Lord spoke to me that. And I heard Jesus say, and you know, the more they say they've heard him, you know, the more you think, gosh, well, I haven't. <laughs> no, if you are his shepherd, he has called you. Or, I'm sorry, if you're his sheep, the shepherd has called you by name and has led you out and you've heard his voice. Not only that, but you'll not hear the voice of a stranger. So the thieves and the robbers, ultimately, you'll test it and, it, and you'll eventually drop it. And that shows that you're his sheep, you know. And we can get caught up and beaten by thieves and robbers uh, for long periods of time. But ultimately, we hear the voice of our shepherd, especially when the trumpet, his voice sounds like a trumpet and he raises us up. We'll all hear then, you know. Maybe we're unclear today, but we'll all be real crystal clear when the shepherd calls us home. And then we'll never have any cloudiness or confusion again. And no one will ever be able to, you know, mess us up or trip us up or offend us or turn us around, you know. An offense, by the way, you just say, well, woe to him who offends one of these little ones. To offend means that you confuse them about the voice of the shepherd so that they... By, by spoiling the gospel, by tampering with the doctrines of the faith, by tampering to that which the spirit bears witness to. It doesn't just mean you have a coarse per personality and pissed a whole bunch of people off because they think you're this and that. No, it's, it's, it's being a thief and a robber and turning people away from the voice of the shepherd and stealing their crown. That's how you offend a little one. Uh, okay, so a stranger they'll not follow, but will flee from him eventually. They know not the voice of strangers. And you say, well, I've I've listened to strangers before. I've been in this institutional church, just been beaten by one of those thieves up at the pulpit, you know. Yeah, we've all experienced it. Um, like Paul says, that you're loving abound yet more and more in all knowledge and discernment that you may approve by testing the things which differ and are more excellent. There is a growth. And Hebrews says that, you know, uh, strong meat is for those who have exercised their senses to discern between good and evil. It is a growth process. It is for a maturation to recognize the voice of the shepherd to the point where you won't hear the voice of a stranger. That takes a while. Don't be hard on yourself if you got caught up. You, in fact, you wouldn't know the shepherd's voice so clearly if he didn't give you a backdrop of if the strangers weren't there, you wouldn't have anything to test the shepherd's voice against. You know, now I know so many things that I didn't know before because I've been through the backside of Christianity and I've heard so many strangers and now I recognize more clearly the voice of the shepherd more than I ever have. So I'm glad for all the places I've been in ultimately. He says, this parable, Jesus spoke to them, and they understood not what things that he were that he spoke to them. And then Jesus said, verily, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. You say, well, what about Moses? Is he a thief and a robber? No, because Jesus sent Moses. The prophets all were sent by Christ and spoke according to the testimony of Christ, which the Spirit of Christ in them bore witness to. So that's the shepherd's voice too, okay? Um, and he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And pasture is the place where there is food. And pasture is the place where there is rest. Pasture is the reality of the good land. Pasture is the reality of the Sabbath. Pasture is the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah glory is, where the shepherd lives. And we've been brought in by a new and living way, which is his own flesh. He brought us in by himself. He is the door. We literally entered into that pasture by him. There's no other way to uh, that's legitimate, you know. Um, but the thief comes uh, to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he come and steal, and kill, and destroy? Pasture. He comes to steal the food 
and steal the supply and steal all the all the things that the good land supplies he tries to steal it out of your hands he can't steal it out of the good land but he tries to get you distracted and bring you back out out of the pasture really um, by speaking you know the thief comes to speak and if you hear his voice and follow him you're going to lose so much enjoyment of Christ and your pasture, and you're going to find yourself starving without food, beaten. You're going to have no assurance. You know, these are the work salvationists. These are the Gnostics. These are the people with a false gospel or another Jesus or another spirit that are speaking in the sheepfold. They climbed in another way. Okay. They have not gone through the door and they don't even know what that means. They definitely don't know what the pasture really is. They've never enjoyed it. They just, but by their speaking, they rob you of your enjoyment of that pasture. The thief comes not, but to still kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life is the pasture, and it is his life. It is the eternal life. It's all the riches of Christ as our food and drink for our enjoyment and satisfaction. That is life, and that's the pasture. So when we enter in by him, we find pasture because it's his life. Uh, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose sheep, his own sheep are not, uh, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and he cares not for the sheep. Uh... A hireling is someone that's working for a wage, okay? And this is where the mammon view of rewards kicks in. Because, you know, Balaam, it says, he went after the wages. The He went after wages. He went after the reward. Um, and that's per, per, put it in a negative sense. He was willing to serve, in a sense, but for money. You know, and in the same way, some people serve God because they have a view that they're going to get rewarded if they do X, Y, Z. It turns out to be a works concept. And it shows that they're a hireling and they're not motivated by their care for the sheep. They're motivated by their own concept of reward. That's a hireling. Now, they can be sheep. They can be. These are not necessarily the same as the thieves and the robbers. Or the wolves. These are just people who get out of the way when the wolf comes because they don't want to cause any trouble. And they don't want to... You know, if you're motivated by works, your concern for the sheep isn't going to cause you to risk anything, to lay your life down, to put yourself on the line, put your reputation on the line by calling out, hey, there's a wolf, you know. No, you're going to step out of the way and go, I don't want to... I don't want to disturb the water i don't want to mess things up um i'll, I'll, I'll talk to you guys later <laughs> you know that's what a hireling is he flees why because he's a hireling and he doesn't care for the sheep so ultimately the only real shepherd is christ himself he went into the den of wolves and thieves and robbers knowing that he was going to offend them to the point where they were going to kill him and in doing so he was laying his life down for the sheep he didn't run from the wolves. He went right in there, you know, and only the Lord can do that. You know, in a sense, we're all hirelings, but our service and our love for the gospel and our zealous guarding of our own crown will cause us to fight when we see thieves and robbers. And you can recognize sometimes a hireling because they won't fight. They'll call for unity or they'll say, it's not that big of a deal, you know. Uh, they will not guard, especially if it's going to cost them something. Because a hireling is motivated by saving his own life and preserving himself and gaining something. He's working for a wage. And if you have a works concept of reward, it can lead to being a hireling. Because your focus is not on... Uh, well, you're not even eating necessarily the same food at that point as the sheep, you know. 
I don't want to get too far into it. I'll just leave that alone. Uh, the hireling flees because he's a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am a good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. And as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Now this knowledge of the Father, of the Son, and the Son of the Father is the eternal life. It's called the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And that's what First John says is, this is eternal life, that they are, well, John 17, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is eternal life. And see, I said in the last message I gave, um, that we like to say, well, Christianity is not a religion. It's a personal relationship with God. And we think that it's our relationship with God that we're establishing, which is based on our identity, our past, our interests, and our works. No. Um, what Christianity is, is a relationship between the Father and the Son. It is the knowledge of the Father that the Son has and the knowledge of the son that the father has as the father knows me even so i know the father and i lay my life down for the sheep what is that life it's the it consists of that knowledge the eternal life is this relationship between the father and the son and when he laid his life down that life became ours that relationship became ours that fellowship became ours that knowledge became ours and so that because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's not my relationship with God. It's Christ's relationship with God. Christ is the keeper of the covenant. He's the one who cut the covenant with God. He's the one to whom all the promises were made. He is the heir of all things. And he is the one who loves the Father. And he's the beloved son of God. And we've been made members of Christ by this life. And so our relationship with God is somewhat vicarious. It is not based on ourselves. It's based on Christ. And that's what it means to mature. The more we understand this, the more Christ becomes our point of reference. And we realize my life is Christ. For me to live is Christ. How do I know God? It's because Christ revealed him. How do I know Christ? Because the Father revealed him. How do I come to God? It is in Christ. Through him, the door. See, a thief and a robber ultimately wants to establish their relationship in the pasture apart from the door on their own merit based on themselves. They have not come in through the door. So they want themselves to be the basis of their relationship with God. But what Christ wants is his life to be your relationship with God, his life to be your pasture, his life to be your satisfaction. And your, his life is the door. And his life is his voice. And that life consists of the Father's knowledge of him and his knowledge of the Father as a fellowship. That's what the eternal life is. That's why I have a problem, you know, with oneness Pentecostalism. You know, the ones who say that Jesus is the Father. If that's the case, then you miss this whole dimension of the fellowship that exists. You don't know what eternal life is. Eternal life is the knowledge, the father's knowledge of the son and the son's knowledge of the father. It's God himself. It's the triune God that's existed eternally, you know, in each other, the father in the son and the son in the father as a fellowship in this perfect knowledge. And now the, by giving his life to us, he brings us into the knowledge of God that he enjoys. That knowledge is deeper than anything the angels will ever understand. We've been brought directly in to the heart of God. That's what the Holy of Holies is with the hidden manna. You know, the manna is in a pot, a golden pot, uh, which is in the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the Holy of Holies in the back of the tabernacle behind the veil. That is the depth. That represents the very depth of God's own being that we're brought into that's as deep as you can get it's just, it's the most secret place and yet he says he who overcomes i'll give the hidden manna which is this knowledge it's this life it's this pasture um and no thief or robber can ever get into that pasture they may think they're in it but they're not other sheep I have that are not of this fold that I'm them I must bring and they'll hear my voice and there'll be one fold and one shepherd Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life 
that I may take it again. Uh, no man takes it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. And this commandment I have received of my father. I'm going to just leave it there. I don't have much to say about that. Uh, I think I've said enough at this point. All right, well, have a good day, and I'll talk to you later.